seated at the right hand of God today as a witness for all eternity that this is the real you. The real you is not the fallen creature. The real you is the one seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places. Now I know the gospel we come to preach doesn't line up with any other gospel you've ever heard. And it sounds like a foreign language. Guess what? It is. God came and introduced His own language when the Logos took on flesh. See, we make theology our studies about God. And so we go to Bible school, theological school, and we study about God. And we dig through the Old Testament and we try and discover what God is like by the way he interacted with Moses, by the way he interacted with Elijah. And we try and figure out who God is and we come up with theology. The word theology means theo, God, logos. In other words, God's logic or God's revelation of truth. God's own revelation of who He really is. And you can only find that one place. In the revelation of Christ Jesus. In the incarnation. Not in some school somewhere. That's why Paul says, listen, when God revealed His Son in me and birthed me in the ministry, I did not get that from man schooling. In fact, everything I got from man schooling, I had to throw out. I had to see it as poop. <laughs> That's what he said. See, at one time, Paul, his whole identity was wrapped up in the fact that he's a son of Benjamin himself. Comes from the tribe of Benjamin. His whole identity of himself, his own pride, was centered in the fact that I studied under Gamali. And I know the scriptures. And I know the law of Moses. And I think I've got a pretty good handle on who God is. Paul was an arrogant, prideful, religious man. A know it all. Who had some standing in society because after all, he wasn't just anybody. He was, you know, grandfather Jacob's blue-eyed boy's heritage. But he said, when God revealed his son in me, not to me, in me, when I discovered that Jesus was a mirror in whom I see myself, that changed everything. He says, when God revealed his son in me, he cut me loose from my mother's womb, from everything that my heritage represented. And let me just say, down south where we come from, people are strong on their heritage. Boy, they want to preserve that rebel flag. Because this is who we identify ourselves with. And we've got a proud heritage. We help kick the British out of America. And we almost keep, kick the Yankees' butts too. But they're still trying to retell the story of the Civil War. But guess what? You northerners aren't much different. And I know you can kill me for that because I'm just a foreigner and come away from Africa. What do I know? But <laughs> the truth is, we as human beings are always looking for identity and trying to cling to something to, to add value to our life, to add some worth to our life. I refuse to tell everybody about my bad uncle who ended up in jail, but I'll tell everybody about the one who became mayor, just so I can feel a bit about myself. <laughs> but see, you are more than what your heritage could possibly be about. Yeah. You may have received your body from your parents. You may have been born up here by accident. But that does not define who you are. Your greatest successes in life cannot define who you are. Yeah. And neither can your worst failures. Yeah. What a relief. Yeah. I don't have to define who I am. 
What a relief. I don't have to try and cling to some inferior identity and exalt that as something special just so I can sell myself to other people and win their favor and their approval. I thank God He set me free from having to live for other people's respect and approval. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not about to turn into the kind of rebel that totally violates people's trust and goes around, steals, kills and destroys. What has happened to Paul was that his religion and his pride made him prejudice. Boy, in America is one of the most prejudiced countries on the face of the earth. His religion and his pride made him prejudice. But when God revealed the truth to him, revealed his sonship to him, he began to see his value and his worth from God's perspective. He began to understand how much God values him. That his identity is in God. That God is my dad. Way before I assumed all these other identities, God was the one who identified me. He is the father of all spirits from whom every family in heaven has his name. He's the father of your spirit, my spirit. See, you have another birth. You have been born of the Spirit. I'm not talking about being born again. I'm talking about your original birth. Where did you originate? You didn't originate in your mother's womb. You originated in the very heart of God. It's the Spirit of God Himself that gave your spirit birth. And then He put you in your mother's womb. And there He clothed you with flesh. But you are so much more than flesh and blood can reveal about you. You are a spirit being. You have your origin in the spirit dimension. You come from God who is spirit. You come from Him who is love. So you have your whole design wrapped up in the love of God. And when Paul saw the agape of God, the love of God, he became caught up in a language of equal value that included all other men. And therefore he could no longer see any other man from a human point of view, from a natural viewpoint anymore. But he, he only saw them as children of God. Whether they knew what they were or not didn't make any difference to Paul. Whether they were saved or unsaved made no difference to Paul. I know who you really are. And let me share with you the language of equal value because God has already valued you. I so thank God that He established our worth and our value before time began and then re revealed it in Christ because we lost our way. He already measured you and then found you wanting. He found you secure in His arms. See, before you lost your way in Adam, He already found you in Christ. God already knows and has established your worth. Your worth to Him, His own life. He'd rather die than live without you. So He came to prove it. He came to demonstrate it just so that we could believe it. God didn't just stop with words. He came with actions. He says, this is what you're worth to me. Even in your worst rejection of me, when you nail me to the cross, I will still be crying out, I love you, Father, forgive them. They're ignorant, they haven't got a clue what they're doing. Even in your worst rejection of me, I'll raise you up to newness of life. Because the resurrection could have been zombie apocalypse. I mean, it could have been the earth's worst day, worst nightmare. Because here they had just killed God himself in the flesh, and now he's alive. Can you imagine facing such a horror? Especially if he ended up being the kind of God they believed he was. If he ever was angry at us before, this is D-Day. I'm pushing the red button. You all are getting wiped off the face of the earth. But he didn't do that. His resurrection is proof that he has no judgment in him towards us. 
that He already judged us. As far as He's concerned, judgment is over and never coming again. See, did Jesus didn't come to take some of our judgment and then prolong the judgment so that the real judgment will happen somewhere later. See, religion always puts that in the back of your head. You know, you better live up to it, otherwise judgment day is coming. <laughs> The God who loves you with everything He is, with everything He has, would rather die than live without you. Didn't Jesus say the Father judges no one? Jesus said that. We're not talking Moses who was a little confused, Isaiah who thought he saw everything. We're talking Jesus. The one who saw things for what they were. He says the Father judges no one. And he's given all judgment to the Son. And then he says the Son did not come into the world to condemn the world. But to save the world. So this is my judgment. The Father gave the judgment to me because he didn't want to be the judge. Biggest scandal of the universe. The God is supposed to be the judge of all decides I don't want to be the judge. I'd rather give it to my son. I don't, I don't want that, that label on me. I'm father. I'm love. I don't want that stuff. Gave it to Jesus. And Jesus decides, okay, if I'm going to have to be the judge, then okay, this is my judgment. I'm not coming to condemn the world, but to save the world. Amen. This is my version of retribution. you got your version of retribution, and you think everybody deserves, you know, God, I've been a goody two-shoes, so I deserve heaven one day. But some of them other rascals. Mm, I'm so glad there's a hell waiting for them. <laughs> and we keep perpetuating yeah. Greek mythology when Jesus has already revealed theology. Are you getting what I'm saying? He revealed the judgment that has come in Him. And the kind of judgment which love Himself revealed blew our minds is beyond our comprehension of judgment. Our comprehension. That's the only time where I can say, yes, God's ways are way past out of finding out. The wisdom of God is way out there. Because God in His wisdom came to reveal a judgment that is not puny and petty and short-sighted and blind like our retributive justice system. That's not justice. God who is love, who is the most creative being in the universe. When he exercises judgment, it's going to be full restoration, nothing less. See, we think somebody deserves death, and God says, no, they deserve their eyes open so they can be rescued from the lies they've been living and the crap they've been expressing. Because all the stuff that they're expressing that you're getting hung up on, I just see that as confusion in the, on display. I'm going to rescue them from their blindness. I'm going to rescue them through my love. I'm going to open their spiritual eyes. I'm going to transform them from the inside out so they can become the butterfly they really are. Amen. Instead of living the life of a caterpillar. That's God's sense of justice. He is savior, not psychotic. <laughs> And the religion has spun us such a lie about the Father that somehow, you know, Jesus is the good side of God and the Father, you know, he's the mm, not so naughty, grumpy old side of God. And so now Jesus had to come and kind of stand in the gap between us and Daddy because Daddy has some, some issues, you know, some anger management issues. And so now Jesus has to be our mama and come stand in the way so Daddy doesn't kill us today. And that's how religion has portrayed Jesus. As if God came in agreement with our sacrificial system. Because our sacrificial system is, oh, God is so mad, he's going to require blood. So I'd rather kill an animal and sacrifice an animal and give him the bloodlust that he has so that can, that can be satisfied. So at least he doesn't kill me and he can show me some favor. And that's the religion. Always bringing their little sacrifice, trying to get an angry God to be a little favorable towards them. And then one day God shows up and he says, through John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God. 
And the religion would say, oh, goody, God also now brought his own lamb so that he's not going to get him in with our sacrificial system. So he's also now going to spill his blood to, to help cover our sins, to help appease an angry God. And so we've told the story of salvation that way for years. See, Jesus didn't come to rescue us from some secretly vengeful God and put off his anger for a little while until the second judgment. That's not what Jesus came to do. In Jesus, God was saying, here's my little lamb trying to win your favor because I'm not the angry deity that has to be won over. You're the confused and angry ones that has to be rescued from your anger, from your violence, from your murderous spirit. See, because you become like the God you believe you worship. And because we believe we worship a moody old God that can never make up his mind whether he likes us or not, we become the same way. We become moody, we're full of attitudes, and we have a murderous spirit whether we realize it or not. Somebody just push the right button and you will quickly see what comes out of your ugly old self. And see, that's exactly what God came to do. Jesus came and provoked every religious spirit and every attitude and every wrong thinking just by being himself to the point where that whole thing manifests. And humanity revealed its worst evil. Humanity at its worst nailed love at its best to the cross and said, we reject you, we don't want you. Because you didn't come and look like what we wanted you to look like. See, they missed the Messiah and they missed. And even the Pharisees, Jesus challenged them. He says, man, you're so religious. You make so much of the scriptures. You study them day in and day out. And you think they know, you know what they're talking about. But let me tell you, these scriptures are all about me. And here I am standing in front of you and you want to kill me. Because the God you have painted in your own mind, this concoction you've come up with, this picture of God, you've come up with, is now being challenged to the core, and I am not him. But everything about me tells your inner man that I am indeed your God. That's what Nicodemus said, came in, coming in private to come see Jesus. He says, listen man, we all know you're the son of God, but for fear of one another, we kind of don't want to admit it. We don't really want to come out and say what we really feel, but because we're kind of controlled by everybody else's opinions around here. But that's why I came to see you in the dark, because God forbid, please don't tell anybody I was here. But please, just tell me. I just really want to know. How can I get to heaven? How can I get to, closer to heaven? Our religion today still reads that all wrong and says, how can I get to heaven one day? He wasn't talking about getting to heaven one day. He was talking about heaven, the reality, the right now reality, the spirit dimension. How can I interact with the spirit dimension? I mean, your relationship with God is so alive and so beautiful. I mean, Jesus, everybody admires you. There's something about you that is just so attractive. How can I get there? And Jesus said to him, unless someone is already from that dimension. They would have no desire for that dimension. So I'm really glad you may finally acknowledge that you do have a desire for that dimension. If you demonstrate you're closer to the kingdom now than you've ever been. Because truly, whatever is born of the spirit is spirit, and whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. And you have a flesh birth, but you also have a spirit birth that you've ignored for way too long. And what was Nicodemus' reaction? His religion got in the way and he got all confused and says, what the heck are you talking about? How can I be born again a second time? You know, it was born, out, you know, they only believed in natural birth. I was born once from my mother. How can I go back in that womb and try and be born again? I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, no. You know, I mean, just make it plain to me. Come on, don't, don't be the crazy one. They all say you are. Eight minutes, just speak plain English so I can understand. Oh, sorry. Plain Aramaic, so I can understand. And Jesus 
made it very clear to him. No one can ascend to that other spirit dimension if they did not first come from that dimension. And he wasn't just talking about himself. He was talking about the identity of man. He was trying to get Nicodemus to see that there's another dimension about your existence which you've ignored for way too long. Which you don't. How is it that you, a teacher of Israel, don't know these things? You're trying to lead Israel to God and you don't know the, 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 the most important key of it all. See, and today we're no different. We're just as confused as poor Nicodemus was. Because our religion has messed with our heads. So much that we've been told from generation to generation to generation. We've just swallowed hook, line, and sinker as if that's the truth. Well, can't be wrong, my granddaddy taught me that. Can't be wrong, my pastor who went to school for seven years taught me that. But we really, 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 really have to think about what God revealed in Jesus. And when you really, 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 really begin to think about what God revealed in Jesus, it is going to shock you. He's going to challenge you to the core about everything you believe. See, because God doesn't come and tell you you're wrong. He just comes, comes to show you the truth and you discover I'm wrong. See, when God comes on the scene, He first impacts your heart and your head just has to catch up later. And when He revealed to me, when I finally got it, that He is love and nothing else. He's not love but... You know, you hear people say, God is love, but He is also just. The minute they say, but He is also just, it reveals to me they haven't got a clue who He is. They're still trying to marry the God revealed in Jesus and the God of the Old Testament, and they confuse it all, get out. Yes, He's just, but His justice is way beyond ours. And in that statement, he is love, but he is also just. They keep every myth and every lie alive. And it's back to distance and delay. God is not close to you. You have to try and get closer to him. And all this good stuff is on delay until his second coming. And then somehow he has to come back now in his second coming. And turn into a tyrant, a dictator who rules the nations with an iron fist and make them submit because he wasn't smart enough to win them over with the argument. See, the gospel is an argument with man in which God comes to convince us of what truth really is. And if we can't communicate the gospel clearly enough, no wonder no one sees. But the gospel reveals the righteousness of man. It reveals God's righteousness in us. That's what the gospel does. It reveals to us our original design. The way God sees us. That's why Paul added that little statement. He says it's from faith to faith. From that word, from is the word ek. Out of God's faith, we discover our own. Out of understanding what God sees and what God believes, we find faith. Jesus defines faith. We don't have to try and go and define it somewhere else. God already will revealed what He believed in Jesus. And God believes in us. That's what He revealed in Jesus. He revealed our value to us. Remember the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son? In every one of those parables, He was revealing how Man has never lost his value to God. That God has come out of his way. He's gone out of his way and he's come in person to win us back. Just like that woman who lost the coin, swept the house, was so consumed with that coin she couldn't even go on washing the dishes. She had to sweep the house, do what she had to do to find that coin because she knows that that coin, I need that coin to buy my loaf of bread. Without that coin, I'm not going to be able to buy my loaf of bread. I want that loaf of bread. So I'm going to have to go rescue that coin. Because I don't care if that coin is lying in darkness under the cabinet where the cockroaches run back and forth. 
that coin hasn't lost the image and likeness engraved on that coin. And as long as that image and likeness is on that coin, that coin is a coin, is a coin, is a coin. It has the same value. It's not going to go away. Amen. See, but we live in a society where value fluctuates all the time. But God came to reveal to us that your fluctuating value is a result of your confusion. I have never been confused. The love of God revealed in Christ is the constant of God. God revealed to us His constant estimation of our worth. That we are worth everything to Him because He will never lose track of the fact that we bear His image and likeness. The sheep may have lost His way. But the shepherd haven't lost sight of the sheep. He will come find them. What happened to the prodigal son? Sitting there eating pig fruit. Like many of us are. Living in a hell of our own making. The very word hell. Ha he days. Ha not to he days to see. Our blindness. Our not to see causes our hell. See God doesn't have to create hell. We create our own hell. When you reject Mr. Love himself. You go against your design. And if that is not self-destruct mode, I don't know what is. And we exist in hell. A hell of our own making. And one day when you leave this life, you're not suddenly going to wake up and say, Whoa! You're going to continue, except in a worse state than ever, because this dimension we live in, this natural dimension affords us a little bit of light. You know, while we live in this dimension, we can deceive ourselves and pretend. Because this kind of protects us from that unseen realm. And so many people live in this seen realm with blindfolders on and going along life's way, ignoring God as if He doesn't exist. And they can happily go on doing that, just being stuck in this natural dimension with their blinders on and living in ignore mode. But guess what? When this life is over, you are face to face with Mr. Love himself. And you are not going to escape his love. And the same love that is an all-consuming passion within us becomes an all-consuming power and fire to those who are rejecting him. And now you are in his presence, the very one you've rejected and don't want anything to do with. And you can't escape it. Can you imagine what torture and torment that would be? Not because God's tormenting you, but because you, you're in torment. Your whole being is in torment. You put yourself in torment. You live in a hell of your own making. Now, whether you believe that that's really what hell is going to be like, or, or, you know, that doesn't matter to me. Revelation says that the devil and his angels will be thrown in the 